I think we're at a little bit of an inflection point. Those commodity price uh, tailwinds have definitely helped a lot. So I'll give you an example. Uh, so far in the Yukon, 170 million raise of equity for Yukon related projects year to date in 2024 versus last year, I think it was about 130 all year. 43% of that money was raised in June, just in the past 20 days of that 170 million. But we're seeing a lot of life in certain stocks. So, so I'm, I'm actually quite bullish. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter and, of course, the host for this conversation. And as you can tell, we're back in our studio in Vancouver and I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we have lined up for you now. It's a returning guest. We've had him on in September, end of September. It's Michael Gray of Agentis. He's the managing, uh, or managing partner, founder, and, of course, head of research over at Agentis. We've had some great feedback on the conversation and uh, nine, ten months later, it's time for an update because we talked about the junior mining space. He, he's a phenomenal analyst in the junior mining sector, and uh, we got to look at some of his calls, but also like sentiment. What, what is it looking like right now? We're trading at 2340, 2350 gold per ounce. We're back over $30 silver. Really curious where Michael's thoughts are and how, how the metal prices also factor a bit into the decision making here. But uh, before I switch over to my guest, hit that like and subscribe button. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Michael, it is great to welcome you back on the program. It's good to see you. Yeah, great to be back, Kai, and uh, welcome to sunny Vancouver. It's gorgeous outside. Yeah, it is. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's a bit, a bit of a shame we're sitting here in the studio. We should be doing this out on the seawall. We should. Well, let's do the next time. <laughs> next one we should do outside <laughs> okay. and we should do live. Um, no, Michael, yeah. really appreciate you joining us again. As I said, like you've been on the channel back in September. I think yeah. September 23rd, we published the last conversation. We, we got to talk sentiment. Like gold sure. prices moved dramatically since yeah. March. Uh, silver prices moved dramatically. Copper to a degree moved, moved yeah. uh, quite a lot. Let's start with a sentiment check. Like uh, how, how is, what's sentiment like in the junior mining space these days? I think it's, I think it's mixed. Uh, there's definitely the haves and the have nots out there, but I think it's dramatically improved. Um, one thing back in September, 2023 was the sentiment was poor. It was tough to raise money. Uh, and I think people were really down in the dumps in the junior mining sector overall. It's really changed for good projects uh, in the right locations, capital is being raised. I'll give you an example. Uh, so far in the Yukon, 170 million raise of equity for Yukon related projects year to date in 2024 versus last year, I think it was about 130 all year. 43% of that money was raised in June, just in the past 20 days of that 170 million. So there, I think we're at a little bit of an inflection point. Those commodity price uh, tailwinds have definitely helped a lot. Um, and so <clears throat> I think for the right projects, high quality projects, well managed, uh, good stewardship amongst the junior mining companies on these projects, maybe with a sponsor, a strategic investor or or a key sponsor, key fund. Uh, we're seeing a lot of life in certain stocks. So, so I'm, I'm actually quite bullish. Yeah, you seem quite energized. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's fantastic to get that feedback because I was in New York at a conference the other day and uh, or in May, and we were talking about it. We looked at the Orin Inc. numbers and they were dismal. Like I was mm. looking at, uh, I think, the May 10th numbers. I have to run the numbers again. But we only raised about $1.3 billion for our coverage universe, which is the the juniors, you know, $1.5 billion and below in market cap. Financing's below $100 million. It was, it was bleak. As you said, like there's a bit of a massive, or not just a bit, there's a massive disconnect or a bifurcation happening. Yeah, no, it's it's very asymmetric. Uh, I agree. And it, and it goes into pockets and jurisdictions. They're going to get outsized amounts of money. I think the Yukon is getting that right now. Uh, places where the seniors want to be, they don't want to be in high risk areas in general. So we're focused more on the lower risk. So I think you have to navigate that, you know, as a as an investor. Uh, so we're we're uh, you know uh, seeing those signs, and it's not easy by any means. We're also, I think I mentioned back in September, you know, keep in mind it's a million dollars to run a junior mining company just to keep lights on. There's a lot of junior mining companies. <laughs> so therefore you have to be, you know, have a power, powerful filter and focus on best quality, best in class as far as we're concerned. Uh, one, one interesting sentiment indicator for me is the activity of the banks and what the banks are doing. And mm -hmm. what I'm seeing right now, a lot of banks are dissolving their mining teams. Yep. Laurentian threw yep. in the towel, yeah. for example. Stiefel yep. just closed their Calgary office like this week, earlier yep. last week, right? So a lot of like change happening in the, on the banking side, which doesn't give me a lot of confidence <laughs> Or it gives me the confidence to say this is the bottom. It could be. Yeah. How, how do you feel about that? What, what are you seeing there? 
Well, it's, yeah, it's a good observation. It could be signs at the bottom. It's, uh, it's also, uh, the, the capital markets have really been broken for several years now, probably since 2018 or so, in the sense that the traditional financing sources, that, that group of funds, whether it be in Toronto or New York, haven't been there for the juniors, for the explorers. And there's been so many brokers and banks uh, with mouths to feed that it's been very tough to do that. Hmm. So the analyst coverage has gone down in terms of volume of juniors being covered. And the, uh, the analysts themselves have been attracted to come to the companies and work for companies. Brock Coulter, John's a good example. Good young analyst with Cormark. Jumped to Onyx to, to uh, lead that as CEO and, and take that on, that Canadian gold explorer. And, and we've seen that in a number of cases, individuals being attracted to corporate development roles. And it's kind of been a brain drain from the, at least the Canadian analyst pool. That well, I've not, seen. not just the analysts, like your big salespeople are yeah. like big names are uh, changing jobs right now as well. Like I've, seen, I've heard of Move here uh, out of Toronto or actually Canaccord. Uh, one of their big sales guys yeah. is going corporate. Yeah. I don't know where he's landing, but uh, yeah. big, Greg big Huffman. shifter. Yeah, Greg Huffman. Like, yeah, I didn't want friend. to throw the name yeah, there no. in there, but uh, no, no. yeah, no. That, but he's moving, right? Uh, not sure where he's going to land, but he's going corporate, from what I've been hearing, right? So there's, yeah. there's changes on that front as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Curious what that means in terms of deal flow, perhaps as well, because we haven't seen the there. There has been some MMA. Maybe I'm too greedy, but uh, we haven't seen the the flush of MMA, like the the amount, like the flurry of MMA activity that maybe we've all been hoping for. Yeah, it, I think there's signs of it. Uh, maybe some smaller deals, some smart consolidation, uh, you know, a few tuck-ins and things like that. But yeah, we haven't seen the flurry amongst the, uh, no. certainly the developers uh, on the gold side. Uh, I think that will come. There's not a lot of product out there. On a global basis, there's very few single asset developers, or sorry, producers and single asset developers. There's a big focus on Canada, so it'll be really, really interesting to see, you know, once Artemis gets into production, uh, once Skeena gets permitted and they get, you know, if they construct and build and they're in production, Ascot's about to, uh, you know, they pour gold, now they're going to go into commercial production by about the end of the year. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of companies that are on that threshold of something potentially happening on M&A, especially yeah. in Canada. Yeah, a lot of single asset producers, as you, as you mentioned, yeah. like as you said, Artemis, <coughs> Ascot, Victoria, we're in their office, right? Yes, single yeah, asset Victoria, producers. Yeah. Um, so there could be some movement. But the uh, qu question is like a lot of activity in Canada, but it's like, is, is the interest really there? Are those projects big enough to, to, to move the needle for anybody and who would acquire them? Like you, you mentioned the mid-tiers developers, is, is that more of a mid-tier consolidation that a bunch of, let's say 200,000 ounce producers get together? Uh, yeah, well, certainly the existing mid-tiers out there should be interested in, you know, 150 to 200,000 ounces per year. I think the seniors are very focused on scale in terms of 300,000 ounces a year or greater, and there aren't a lot in the pipeline. There's only about three or four companies in the world with that type of scale, tier one production right now. K92 being one, which we cover, is a proto 300,000 ounce per year uh, producer. But there's very few of them for the on the menu for the seniors to look at, uh, and there's not a lot in the pipeline. There's only about seven in the pipeline. We'd put Snowline in the pipeline, you know, even though they just put out a resource. We'd say, yeah, they're definitely in that category of tier one, proto, uh, you know, producer type assets. So it the world's very uh, very very thin when it comes to those type of we're, assets. We're, we're going to get to your thoughts on Snowline yeah, like towards sure. the end of the discussion because I'm really curious yeah. to pick your brain and whether that was within your expectations yep. and your range and what you've been looking at. But um, to, to stay a little more higher level, real yeah. quick on, on sentiment as well because yeah. we've been discussing on the channel here is like what what could be a trigger that would lead to maybe the generalists coming back to the sector, right? And we've been debating it's like oh is it you know the higher gold price, but do we need to, to see the producers produce first properly? Like meaning show way more. Free cash flow is that a potential trigger for you? Like Q two, like I think the average gold price is over twenty two eighty, yeah. right? So, could that be a trigger? Yeah, I think I think the uh, the generalists uh, are starting to come into the larger, you know, caps, the barracks and the Newmonts, and and or getting exposed to the ETFs and things like that. But you know, if they start to uh, start to take positions and there's and there's a you know a buy in. Uh, there's been a lot of disappointment over the years amongst the producers, how they've uh, come, the generalists took positions in 2016, for instance, and uh, when the gold price had a little bit of a run, a lot of research teams were then in, in the portfolio manager uh, teams looking at it. We did extensive marketing when I was at Macquarie, and they found that when the gold price came down 
the equities went down 30 percent <laughs> and that wasn't very fun for them so they really backed off it's going to take quite something for them to come back in they're going to go with the big liquid names and i think it's going to take a lot for them to come down the food chain into the non-producers and maybe not into the uh you know juniors at all so I think I think that's might be a stretch in this broken capital markets world we have. I was going to say, who who are we competing with these days? Like back in the day, it was easy yeah. pinpoint. Okay, Bitcoin and the beat, and you know the the, yeah. the, the, the shit coins really stealing our money, right? Yeah, stealing. But then we had the weed craze that was taking money from the juniors. But like, who are we competing with? It feels like there's no competitor left uh. that we're competing with, unless you would really want to go S and P five hundred and talk Nvidia and Microsoft yeah. and maybe Amazon, I think, right? It, I think that's part of it because the demographics we're dealing with. Like a lot of the powerful brokers in in Canada, at least, they're uh, they're in their 70s, their mid 70s. <laughs> they're starting to age out, and their clients are all about that age too. So we don't have that young generation that love junior mining stocks that are, have made a lot of money. They're like my son, inclined to invest in the tech companies and the AIs, and they've done really well. So it's going to take a lot to get them back. And and to your point, M and A velocity needs to increase so that. All of a sudden, there's wins on the board almost every month, and investors are seeing that and gravitating towards the best best yeah. stories that have a chance to be taken out. That's that's a good segue. Let, let's break that down sure. and let's, let's be a bit more granular. Let's talk about where you see the opportunity right now within your coverage universe. I'm, I've, I've got your report open here, um, yeah. where where you look at different gold belts uh, in, in the world. Yeah. One is the Golden Triangle. You got the Tintina Gold Belt, which is sort of Yukon, Alaska. Um, Golden Triangle in British Columbia, by the way. Uh, wow. Guyana Gold Shield in Guyana, Suriname, French Guyana, uh, and Central Lapland, which is really interesting. Um, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, let, let, let's run through that. Where do you see opportunity right now? Where's the biggest uh, chance to make some money? Okay. <laughs> well, the first thing, the way we kind of picked those four gold belts was two things. Number one, we've, we think we've been a bit of a leader in both the Golden Triangle and the Yukon, but the results are really driving our thinking amongst these four. Number one, they really lead the charts when it comes to grade times thickness plus 100 uh, gram meter product intersections. So intersection uh, uh, length times gold grade over 100, hmm. that's, that's pretty special to get that type of uh, intersection. So globally, we're finding that um, those four jurisdictions are hitting the top uh, charts, the top 10 to hot, top 20 on a consistent basis. So that's one of our biggest filters. And the two jurisdictions uh, that have really delivered the most over the last 12 months of those type of um, high caliber intersections are up in the Yukon, the Tintina Gold Belt, uh, in particular Tombstone and really dominated by Snowline and then the guy in a shield uh, with 46 each. So I'll be presenting this uh, next Monday, some of these metrics and that, but that's one of our main filters. So first of all, that's one. And then on top of that, where are the seniors? Where are they putting in strategic investments? Where are they looking at doing M&A? That's really important to us as well. They tend to be risk off jurisdictions. Um, so those are those are the four we've, we've identified. We cover quite a few companies uh, in the Golden Triangle and in the Yukon. Uh, we haven't covered anything in Finland. We're looking at a number of things in Finland right now. Mm-hmm. And, and then the only company we cover currently is Founders down in the Guyana Shield, which we, uh, we started covering in, in early May. Yeah. Where, where are the majors deploying capital right now? Where, 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 what are they chasing? Well, they're, they're, uh, they have been you know, buying production assets and consolidating, uh, look at not that long ago, Newmont and Newcrest, right? Yeah. They're doing the mega deals to get more tier one projects into their stables. And for Newmont example, it was quality of assets and also block cape technology. They wanted, they didn't have it. Uh, uh, Tom Palmer wanted that, he coveted it. Uh, having talked to him at the Denver Gold Forum to, for the copper gold projects down at Katy Ridgeway and the proto block cave at Red Chris in the mm-hmm. Golden Triangle. He comes from Rio, so he was used to having that technology. And I think the world is moving that direction for both gold mining and copper gold mining uh, for uh, for the seniors, and then look at look at Barrick. Uh, they're looking at copper globally. Invested in Hercules early stage surprise. I think we may have talked about it in the past. That surprised a lot of the uh, copper players out there, the diversified copper players. That Barrick would move so mm-hmm. quickly on a junior exploration discovery that you know had a lot of really positive indicators. We lit that up with coverage in December, and. Uh, I think we're continuing to look at how important is copper to the seniors. So uh, it's one thing to have a gold project, but if there's a 
you know, a, a really good looking copper gold uh, project. We know the gold companies are going to be very interested in it now. Yeah, they even go to Pakistan for it yeah. as well into yeah. really interesting jurisdictions, <laughs> but, yeah, right? Yeah, an exception to the risk uh, risk on argument. A yeah. couple things to follow up on that you mentioned. Yeah. Maybe let's start with a quick explanation. Why is block cave mining so, so important? Um, not sure everybody's familiar with that term, what that means and the technique. Can you just quickly summarize that? Yeah, it's essentially uh, high capital intensity to actually establish uh, the footprint to actually mine but very low operational cost. It's, it's essentially, it's a, a rock factory where you're propagating uh, uh, the caving of the rock from underground mm -hmm. by excavating uh, uh, channels or holes, and then you don't drill and blast. It just is self-mining, uh, and you excavate it, bring it to the surface. So at the right cutoff grades, uh, bulk mining, uh, you're, you're moving ore to surface, very little waste. It's not like an open pit where you'd be, you know, a strip ratio and putting a lot of waste piles, uh, very low labor intensity. And, and it's a way to, uh, uh, you know, continue mine life from some of these open pits. Ideally an open pit, number of Chilean operations, mm -hmm. mined open pit. Now they've converted uh, their mines into block caves. And that's what's happening, say, at Red Chris, going from the open pit. Uh, Newmont is, is uh, you know, building a block cave there. Uh, low cost, uh, high yield, high margin. What do you need in terms of grade to make it work? Is there a rough <laughs> guideline? Yeah, is there? There, I think right now in this market, it's probably at least 0.8 copper equivalent, um, especially if you've been leveraged by an open pit first and build your mill and infrastructure. It's probably higher than maybe 1.2 okay. to do a standalone block cave. We covered GT Gold and no. we looked at that. Before Newmont bought it, we looked at a number of scenarios, and actually a large block cave standalone looked very attractive. Okay, no, interesting. I appreciate that and uh, that discourse a little bit. And yeah, uh, I mean that's a, a small bit on a, a large topic, but uh, it it is a way to go deeper, right, yeah. and still access economic grade. Um, well, companies are struggling to find reserves anyway yeah. and to replenish those reserves and getting access to them as, as well. So it's, it's an interesting topic to discuss, yeah. right, without getting too technical here. Yeah. Um, on, on the topic of Newmont, before we come back to your regional analysis yeah. here, so I'm just real quick, what are, what are you hearing? Like, I know they're, they got six projects on the chopping block. Uh, what are you hearing? Like, what, what's happening behind the scenes here? Um, maybe you can, you know, move the curtain out of the way for us a little bit. What, what's happening? What, who's buying coffee, for example? It's, it's <laughs> a good question. Uh, I can't shed too much light. I think they'd like to. I don't want to put you in the bad spot here no, as, no, as well. So. Well, I'm, I'm on you know the research side. We only deal with public okay. domain information, and I'll add here we're independent, okay. and uh, our research is information only. We're not trafficking investment advice. Um, I think they'd like to sell all assets, one-stop shopping, to one company if they could. It, they're taking their time. They're not rushing a process, as far as I know, and and. Uh, uh, I think, you know, some of the mid-tiers should be interested in, say, coffee, for example, for that production profile that heap leach has been now proven in the Yukon. John McConnell's done a great job with the uh, leachability of that, you know, a, a northern heap leach. It, it works with a crushing. Uh, coffee has good leach kinetics. So I expect that will go uh, to someone who has comfort working in the north. Uh, I, I think there will be individual assets peeled off. I think certain companies will like... Um, Eleanor, uh, other companies will will gravitate, uh, you know, towards other assets, maybe the Timmins assets. So we'll see. No, it's interesting because I, I was looking for a bit of a shakeup in the sector as well because everybody's looked at it. It's been a twenty billion dollar merger, but nothing's really come out of it. It hasn't really trickled down, but you know, the asset sell could shake things up and create maybe new mid tier producers yeah. that didn't exist before. Right. So that, that's why I was looking at it and from from that angle. Um, let's look at a bit. Uh, come back to the regional. You yeah. know, the themes here. And sure. uh, why do you only have one project in Guyana under coverage right now? Lack of projects or lack of just time? No, it's new for us. Okay. We, we really started putting our lens on Guyana Shield. I've never covered anything down there before. So it's new. And, and we're appreciating more and more that uh, there's a number of high quality uh, projects down there right now. Obviously, uh, Reunion, G2, Oh My. Are emerging but I think one thing that is underpinning it everyone I think that's technical knows that it's part of West Africa you know at one point same age of rocks premium uh, type of uh, rocks which are very good trap rocks um, same geology just jungle cover yet you've got Mirian is a giant 
Anything over 10 million ounces is generally for us a giant. Newmont produces down there in Cernap. Rosa Bell Zinjin is, is mining a giant. That's a 10 million ounce overall past production current reserves. There's not a lot of giant deposits around and the hunting grounds are, are very, very good. So it's, it's been revealing to us, partly the great time sickness again, plus 100 gram meter product is driving us down there when we look at things in terms of uh, they're going toe to toe with the Yukon in terms of delivering those type of results. So that's very, very notable to us. So it's, it's more me being new to that jurisdiction and seeing the potential. Interesting. Like, what are some of the biggest challenges, though? Like, let's look at the, maybe we'll go through. Let's go north to south. Let's start in the sure. in the Yukon, for example. Like, a lot of money flew uh, has been invested. Yeah. You mentioned 170 million dollars just this year alone. But what are the hurdles? What are what is that money trying to achieve, and where, where is it going? Like, we've seen Attack maybe as a negative example. It's been a billion dollar company. I think it just got sold for twenty. Yeah. Right. So uh, twenty million, by the way, not billion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Maybe we have to. Yeah. Add and to I, that. I I covered a tech. I was a bull on the Carlin thesis uh, for a while, and and uh, and it, it didn't work out. But I think that's the allure. It's that frontier lure for tier one mm-hmm. tech deposits. So let's look, let's look where the money has gone. I think fifty million raised by Sandeep Singh with uh, Western Copper and Gold mm-hmm. for the project. Uh, you know, world class uh, porphyry uh, copper gold molly. Uh, that Rio's strategically invested in. That is Western Copper, by the West, way. Western Copper, sorry. Yep. Um, and and uh, and also Mitsubishi. So they've kind of uh, blessed the project on a number of levels. And so that's a big chunk of capital and, and it's gonna be in the permitting process soon. We right. cover that one. We like that a lot, okay? Mm-hmm. In terms of uh, uh, high initial grades, good payback, uh, good quality concentrate. Exit strategy. <clears throat> Well, I think they're sellers. Right. I think I think they would like to sell. I think the key question is is power now. Is 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 there going to be a grid connection from BC possible into the Yukon? I think a feasibility study may happen if the Yukon government leverages some money mm-hmm. uh, from the feds to do that, which I think the premier has really uh, pushed very really hard close on that. I, I think, think so. Right? Yeah, from what I've been here. Yeah, and then you look at forty three million to a uh, fireweed vis a vis the Lundins and other investors. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, on, on what looks to be you know world class uh, uh, lead zinc belt uh, with the new discovery of boundary and and a, a new strategy coming into place right now on how that money will be deployed. Probably more re- regional exploration, setting the table on other targets to find mm-hmm. more boundaries. Uh, so it's it's very concentrated um, pools of capital coming in. Snowline obviously. Uh, Probably, I, I've said this before, probably the best gold yeah. discovery I've seen in 19 years. Putting a pin in a resource at 7 million ounces. Uh, very conservative resource as far as I'm concerned, uh, but great they did it. Um, we're at 11, and actually, I think, uh, you know, our cutoff grade's a little bit lower. We have a higher strip ratio. Um, we still have a you know, robust starter pit like they do. I think they grow theirs substantially beyond 7 million ounces. Uh, as they go forward, so a few differences, but but no, we're we're happy with their resource, and we can we can stand behind ours as well. well our mineral inventory. Yeah. What's the biggest challenge for the Yukon <coughs> for the for the gold belt up there? Like, uh, what's the biggest hurdle? <coughs> like, a lot of money flowing into it, but uh, you know the risk is we're in mining, right? Like, there's always a chance that that money just uh, evaporates. Well, and uh, I, that's I, yeah, I think infrastructure is a big thing. I think Banyan just raising 15 million in the Mayo district uh, and and having great access and infrastructure, low drilling costs, growing a resource rapidly. Uh, that's been positive, but it, it is the lack of infrastructure for a lot of companies in the Yukon. So you've got to have these outsized um, tier one type prizes discovered if you don't have that infrastructure. Uh, Victoria de Gold's done a great job in terms of getting the mine uh, up and running. The, the you know stumbling block is the winters have been tough up there. Surprisingly, they've done much better on the heat bleach kinetics. It's getting the material to tons to pad. So I'm looking forward to doing a site visit next week there to see what their progress is and whether that they're at an inflection point or not. But in the Yukon, permitting is also an issue. I mean, let's face it, uh, Western uh, copper gold is going into the permitting process finally, and it's an arduous process. It's it's a you know. It's, it's, a, it's a tougher process, I think, than certainly BC, where we see three or four companies right now in the permitting process and having a little bit more clear timelines. No. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it is, uh, once you're through it, uh, you're gonna have certainty. So I think that Mayo District is emerging as a very permittable uh, area, having Victoria 
uh, producing. Mm -hmm. I think that bodes well for Banyan and Sitka. And the Nacho and I at Dunn uh, are, are getting very accustomed to what that means economically. Mm -hmm. And the Valley Discovery of Snowline is also in that Nacho Dunn, oh. Dunn territory, albeit without the uh, road <clears throat> access. No, fantastic. Let, let, let's go further south. You brought up the Golden Triangle, BC. Yeah. Seems like more mature of an area. Yeah. Uh, over 4.4 billion in M&A already, just since yeah. uh, 2018. Yeah. Uh, so really way, way further advanced uh, in that regard. Uh, what are the main differences maybe, and uh, what were some of the key factors that sort of left to Golden Triangle's ascent? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, and we've, we've kind of been trying to uh, thematically talk about this. Game changer was the Northwest transmission line. I think it was 2012. It opened up cheap power into okay. the Yukon. SK Creek mine, when it was mining in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, 50% of the costs were diesel. Okay, it was a high grade, small tonnage mine, but it was very, very expensive. And so, with Predium uh, getting lit up as a world class tier one mine that Newcrest bought, now Newmont has, uh, Red Chris wouldn't be a mine without the power coming into sight. So it's changed everything, the power. Now, I would also argue the alignment with the First Nations between the Tultan and the Nishka, very uh, positive towards embracing responsible mining. Those are key for, they have big uh, uh, traditional territories. Nishka has a settled land claim. Uh, the Taltan don't, but have both been on their front foot embracing responsible mining and they probably have full employment, right? Okay. It's been, it's been a tremendous uh, positive thing. The final thing is that revenue sharing, where the First Nations have got a cut of the BC mineral tax, so it's not out of the company's pocket, it's out of the mm -hmm. government's pocket. That's gone to the First Nations. That's been a game changer as well. Alignment with the First Nations has been really important. So, so Michael, uh, let's go further south. Guyana Shield, we briefly yeah. talked about, but uh, what, what makes the geology so special? Like you mentioned, it looks like the West African gold belts, but uh, what, why is that such a special area if you were to compare it with the others? And what are some of the challenges over there? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's got that pedigree, right? The, the endowment uh, empirically with, I think I mentioned, Mirian and Roosevelt both being plus 10 million ounces. And uh, so it's got the right geology. It's, uh, it's been very permissive. So uh, right hunting grounds. And at, in between what Reunion and G2 have documented and what we think uh, that Founders has, we were estimating four to eight million ounces uh, that they've probably documented so far, even though they don't have a resource. It's, it's uh, big hunting grounds, right? So very attractive and, I, and, and we think that uh, it's tougher in, in terms of the jungle cover. Your, your proxy for uh, mineralization and, and success is really the artisanal miners clearing the jungle and excavating the saprolites. So in Google Maps, you can really see that. You can see in 2006, there was a lot of scratching around, say, where the Antino project is of founders, but it would be tough to really extract a lot of information. Roll the clock forward to 2020, and you've got these big, uh, big football field, plus, plus, plus areas of excavation where you've got the bedrock exposed and geologists can go in and actually get the information, the structural information, understand orientations. This has led to founders having a 30% hit rate, which is exceptional, at uh, Froyo and Ginger, that zone. And overall, I think their length weight average uh, width is nine meters of almost seven, uh, oh, sorry, almost eight grams per ton in their one in their main zone that they're documenting right now. Yeah, so, the results have been terrific. And then on of top it. of that, uh, even though there are challenges, say with the jungle cover and maybe the access isn't as good, uh, certainly worth the prize if you can find something big and then the permitting timelines are very accelerated down there. Okay. Barriers to exploration is probably access, the biggest one, yeah. uh, you, you'd say, down there? Yeah, I, th I think I think that's uh, fair. I mean, certain projects have airstrips right on them, and, and uh, you know, locally the access is actually pretty decent. Um, some of them you can only get there by, by rivers, and there's initiatives to maybe build highways and things like that, but access is an issue. No, that makes sense. Okay, now let's put a bow around that. Let's, let's jump to central Lapland as well, because uh, yeah. Rupert Resource has been getting a lot of attention, obviously, over there. Yeah. There's not too much other activity. There's a couple of smaller companies sort of around Rupert, um, but it's not like the Yukon or, uh, you know, the Golden Triangle, where there's a flurry of companies. A, maybe it has to do with it's a 10-hour flight from here uh, to, to get over to Europe and access for, is a different perspective here. But what are some of the main differences? Like, why isn't central Lapland such a boom area as it, the way it should be, maybe? 
Yeah. I, well, first of all, I haven't been there. Okay. So we don't we don't cover any companies, <laughs> so I need to get there. But in talking to a number of the companies, there there's a number of players, but it hasn't maybe quite got the cachet right now in terms of capital flowing. Uh, the access and infrastructure is fantastic from what I understand. It's not like, uh, say, the Yukon without a lot of infrastructure. That part of the world, even though they're up, I think, north of the Arctic Circle, tremendous access and infrastructure. I think there's not a lot of outcrop, hmm. so that makes exploration a little bit tougher, a bit of a barrier. Um, the permitting timelines are, are you know, extended. There's a guarantee as you go through various stage gates, as far as I understand. But the prizes are there. I mean, Kittle is a fantastic uh, mine uh, for uh, Agnico, found through government till sampling. Uh, so very organic in terms of the way that was found. And a number of companies are using those techniques. And then Akari, Rupert's discovery is phenomenal. You know, didn't I missed that one when I was at Macquarie. Uh, very interested in the continuity, the thickness, the scale. It's obviously something the seniors must be looking at but I haven't got first-hand experience. And then you look at all the derivatives. Uh, you know, Ryan's there and S2 doing a deal with Outback, uh, Firefox, and, and uh, you know, I, I want to understand all the players and what the potential is. Yeah. If you were a betting man, Michael, you know, where, where would you put, I don't know, let's put $10 on it. Where would you think the next discovery comes from out of those four regions? Oh, good question. Uh, in terms of new greenfield discovery. Make more greenfields, like, or, yeah, let, let's go with that. Let's simplify it. Really next Greenfields discovery. Yeah, I, you know, based on the capital flowing into regions and the senior mining companies' interest right now and, and the rawness of uh, Greenfields' potential, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat and say mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be tied between the Yukon and, and the Guyana Shield. Now, if things really take off in Guyana Shield, and you've got three countries to deal with, probably mainly Guyana and Suriname, um, you know, that could be that could be a real focus and, and I may hedge that way. Um, but but both the Yukon and Gunna Shield are getting these great time sickness intercepts, the high hit rates for a jurisdiction, albeit leveraged by snow, snow line for the Yukon, but they're also getting the expiration capital flows. Yeah, hundred percent. That's uh, only ten bucks? Ten bucks? I don't know. That's you know, like usually we bet a beer or something, yeah, right? Uh, so yeah. Question is when do we catch them? We see each other frequently enough, yeah, so it should it's be. Got, it's got to be a good European beer, a yeah. German beer, a Belgian oh, I'll bring beer, some. Dutch I'll, beer. Okay. I'll bring some next okay. time, right? Okay. Um, I've interviewed Joanna Ponica um, at the Deutsche Gold Messe the, uh, just in May as well, and one, yeah. one of the things she said, I'm not sure she said it in the interview, but we don't have a funding problem, but a finding problem, which is really interesting thesis because uh, there haven't been a lot of discoveries. Like come to think of it, in 2024 there wasn't really a discovery. A lot of maybe some brownfield hits or so, but not a new discovery like. Snowline, for example, right? But that was a, a couple of years ago. So last 12 months, not really anything new. Like, uh, what, what's your thesis on that? Uh, you know, I think I think there are, you know, you're not going to get a snow line. You're going to get one of those every 10 years. Hmm. It, you know, so we can't be too greedy to use yeah, your, that's a good point. your yeah. expression. I think there's a number of things. I, I'd say, say in the last 12 months, I think Founders has really um, become more visible and, and understood as a, as a uh, even though there was some mineralization there, I think it is a bona fide greenfield discovery mm -hmm. now. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, there's a number of things happening, say in the Yukon, Cascadia has a, a copper gold discovery that's brand new and raw, mm -hmm. and, you know, not that far from Whitehorse and, and you know, has the hallmarks of, uh, you know, a, uh, an alkaline porphyry. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm thinking that you're, you're right in the sense there haven't been a flurry of them, but I think there's actually been a lot of exceptional drill results yeah. that have kind of been lost in the market. Um, you know, you're seeing some good results out of Chile and Argentina right now in the copper gold space. Um, you're, you know, the capital is very concentratedly, uh, I think, getting very concentrated on a very few stories. Philo for a long time. Look at what happened with that in terms of the the story of, of the year or, or something like that. But yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, but we also have a, a very fractured uh, 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 and limited pool of capital, I think, globally to fund this many juniors. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> hedging there. I think, yeah, I think yeah. there are some really good discoveries out there that just aren't getting the capital they deserve. And it, to your point uh, in previous conversations, 
management in this type of market has to communicate extremely effectively. They can lower their cost of capital and get their share price up uh, in that process by really effectively communicating. And I would, I would say that there's maybe only one in 20 management teams are exceptional, elite at presenting. I mean, I don't know if that number rings true with you, but in terms yeah. of invoking that hand to wallet response that I need to own the stock. Barely anybody does that, to be honest. It's, it's tough. Like, and and, and I, I'd say, yeah, it's very, very few. And so I think that in our sector, given how tough it is to raise capital, that's where I think CEOs and, and communication teams really need to sharpen their uh, skill set. Yeah. Now, interesting. One question that came to mind again is like jumping around a little bit, but yeah. uh, if you were to pick a fifth region for your report next time, what region would you pick? Oh, good one. You know, I, I you know, I could say the Abitibi, that's a big region. Um, certainly with the emergence of some of the bulk mineable uh, deposits, you know, Canadian Malartic has, has morphed into underground type situations at yeah. Odyssey. I think that's going to continue throughout the Abitibi, looking at at bigger prizes to depth. Um, other regions I've been watching, but I really haven't seen the breakaway. Uh, you know, Japan looks interesting, but I haven't really seen the success there. Uh, again, looking for seniors' uh, uh, interests with strategic investments and, and other types of uh, signals why a region might be uh, the next one. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of struggling to find that, uh, that fifth one. Well, we're coming. Summer drill season is coming up. We're sitting yeah. here June twentieth, and uh, of course, all the companies are, especially up north, are starting to kick off their drill programs. Yeah. How, how excited are you? Is there anything that you're looking forward in, uh, to in particular? Yeah, no, I'm really excited to see uh, a number of things drilled. Say for say for Snowline, it's it's some of the regional targets that seem to have the right elements, be it the sweet spot of the right elevation, have the right. Uh, uh, aspects and some of the derivatives, certainly, you know, Sitka, Rakla, uh, that are looking for these home run type hits that look like another valley. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, one thing I've noticed is that the companies, specifically the Yukon, but elsewhere as well, uh, the drill programs are quite modest. They've scaled them down. You may have noticed I, I, that I was too. just going to make, I just made a note of that because I sat in a, yeah. in a company, in the office of a royalty company yesterday and they said, well, usually our companies that we are involved with they drill six to 700,000 meters a year. This year, we're looking at 300,000 meters. Yeah, yeah, and individually, companies that might have been drilling 30 kilometers are now drilling six. Yeah. Or 10 are now drilling 2,800. Uh, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because I think the market's been addicted to drill, drill, drill. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these companies are diving in the swimming pool with all their clothes on. They haven't actually set the table and got their ducks in a row. So you're seeing, I think some companies, Banyan, for example, not a huge drill program, very strategically well thought out, uh, good understanding how they're going to deploy capital. Um, I think Fireweed, the same. Uh, just talked to the chairman, Paul Harbridge, and they're pivoting quite a bit more to the regional style. I think, I think it uh, is is a focus on trying to rank targets a little bit differently, and and populate things and set the table with the fundamental geophysics and and geochem. Uh, before uh, going out there and drilling. Yeah, there's a bit more caution as well. Like one company yeah. that comes to mind, I think you met them earlier today, is uh, they got 12 million in the bank, but they're only spending four and a half. <clears throat> so there's yeah. a bit of caution, right? Uh, yeah. As well, maybe less confidence that they can raise more money, even in this market. Yeah, that's, it's, it's a really good point. And, you know, I, I've sat on boards and the one thing I've tried to advocate is let's have a Let's have a war chest of some magnitude, you know, whether it be, let's never drain the treasury under 5 million or under 10 million, whatever seems feasible, and and not get caught up with getting down to your last million or half million dollars and being at the mercy of the markets. It's very tough to do. Yeah. Brings me to my last question, Michael, yeah. is dilute or stop? What camp are you in? It's like, it's an interesting one. I made that analogy in a couple of conversations. Like for me, junior mining companies are like sharks. They stop swimming, they die. Right, so it's you know each company is a bit different, but yeah, uh, generalizing here. But I'm curious, what camp are you in? Are you more in the okay, it's okay to dilute, whatever that means, or are you more in the camp? Ah, let's stop work, preserve capital, and uh, come back when the market is better. Well, you certainly have to define your strategy based on the market conditions and your access to capital. I think it's the probability of discovery. If you're that close and you really have confidence that you know a few holes or or a small drill program, you can reasonably uh, and very tangibly have success, 
then you probably take some dilution and, and uh, swing for the fences to some extent if they're very, very tangible targets. But otherwise, I think more companies probably need to pull back with smaller programs, do more thoughtful work, and maybe don't have to blow their, out, their brains out drilling and, and, uh, and diluting, to your point. Do more geophysics. <laughs> yeah, the, but the, the catch is that you're, you've got a million dollars just to keep the lights on. No. So. It's an expensive game we're playing here. It is. It's, it's it is. not cheap. Yeah. Michael, phenomenal conversation as always. Well, it's I really great always appreciate you coming to the Absolutely. studio. Where, where can we follow you? Like I think uh, you do have some research you send out sometimes. Yeah, we're selectively. We're, yeah, we're, we've got a mainly fund managers, institutions, and and uh, and producers are the main. But uh, I'll send you, I'll send you research, Kai. Anytime. Yeah, yeah. No, but uh, how can people get a hold of you, Michael? Uh, well, I, I, if if they're uh, interested in you know i'm not really talking broadly mainly at conferences and things like that but certainly can get a hold of me uh, through uh through the website agentuscapital.com i Fantastic. think all the contact information yeah, i've been so. trying to get you out to germany for a while now but, so um, we're, we're still working on that okay. trying to figure that out so let's do it it'd let's be hit great that to, bid I, i'll buy you beer there okay. it's better than bringing it over and probably breaking my suitcase so. sounds, sounds good <laughs> fantastic everybody okay. else thank you so much for tuning in very special episode today here in the studio in vancouver I always enjoy speaking with michael gray of agentas i hope you learned something today like there's a lot of a lot, lot of good things happening in the mining space i always yeah. sound very negative i'm a pr guy i always sound very negative maybe I hang out with the wrong people but uh <laughs> and you know who i'm talking about yes but, uh, maybe i hang out with the wrong people but uh, <laughs> there's such a fun and interesting space uh, there's lots happening michael just ran through four of his favorite areas areas uh, that he's been covering and there's lots going on the summer is just around the corner uh, so we'll see a lot of drill results coming out of those areas keep an eye on that a lot of companies good companies have finance or have been able to finance so there's going to be lots of news flow we're looking forward to an exciting summer and uh, i'll get michael back on here in the uh, in the fall to maybe recap some of the results recap some of the site visits he's going on just uh, today actually sure. I think you're flying up to the Yukon uh, in the next 24 hours, I believe. So yeah. uh, lo lots going on. Thank you so much for tuning in. Leave a like, uh, you know, subscribe to the channel. We always appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back with lots more here on Sword Panic. <laughs>